Well, Psalms 82 is a really important psalm for us to understand. It is a psalm of Asaph, again, like all the, the, the previous ones. They're all kind of lumped together here. Um, this one is a really interesting psalm. There are some very profound things we learn in here that we don't get many in many other places in the, in the Bible. Uh, in fact, the Savior himself quotes from this psalm in confounding some of the, the Pharisees and scribes that are trying to question him and trying to basically corner the Savior and, and get him to say something that they can see as blasphemous. And he turns it right around on them. So if you remember, there's the story of when he declares himself as a son of God. And the, the scribes and Pharisees are like, oh, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Oh, my gosh. We can't do that. We can't do that. That's terrible. You, you just declared yourself a God. That's not what the scriptures say, that you can be a God. And so the Savior quotes Psalms 82 to help them understand what he meant. And so they, they can't, and they can't argue with it. It's, it's a beautiful response that he gives. So some fun things that we get to learn in here as well. So let's jump in and get started. Verse one, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Now this is really important, okay, for a couple reasons. One, he is in the, he is standing in a congregation of the mighty. This in a way you could look at the book of Abraham among the noble and great ones and see a, a a parallel to what's happening here. And he judgeth among the gods. Now this is making an assumption that there is a God and lots of other gods. And this one God judges all the other gods. This has reference to a council in heaven. Uh, Dan McClellan has a great research piece that he has put together about the divine councils and about these, these uh, ideas of the that there's more of a, uh, the scriptures used to anciently talk about a council of gods, uh, not just a single God. So this concept of monotheism, there's one God, no other gods, is something that was kind of translated in or interpreted into the scriptures later. So in Psalms 82, we kind of get this inclination that there is a God above the other gods, basically. But that, the, but that, there's other gods that exist, not just one God. There's lots of gods that exist, and there's one God above all of them. Uh, in the ancient world, that God, the high God, is known as El or Elion. Um, and that's, that's the lower gods would be like Adonai or Ashtara and others. Um, and the beauty of this is, is if, of course, if God is a father, which we've learned about, then we have a mother she would be one of the gods as well. So male and female on this council of gods is a very good possibility. So some fun things we get to see in just this chat, just, just the psalm by itself. It's a short psalm. I mean, eight, eight verses and they're short, but profound in some of the insight that it gives us. Uh, there used to be a lot of other scriptures that talked about the grand council, but some of them have been interpreted away from that. Uh, and to a more literal idea of, of uh, monotheism, that there is only one God and no other gods. God doesn't need a council of gods. He's just God. Uh, but yet this, this psalm tells us he's standing among the gods. There's a God that's kind of a head above everybody else, but there's multiple gods. Uh, now verse two, how long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked Selah? <clears throat> so, uh, there's another way to translate this, a more literal translation, according to Dan McClellan, is how long will you judge iniquitously and show favoritism to the wicked, is another way to look at verse 2. So here's this thing. There is God among all these other gods, and he is to be the judge. And the other gods are going, why are you letting the wicked get away with this stuff? Why are you letting them get away with all these things? Now, this isn't that far off even from in the grand stories of Enoch when, the, when uh, Earth is, Mother Earth is telling God, why are you not wiping off the wickedness off my, my face? This is terrible. Get rid of the wicked people off of me. And God says, no, 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 patience. I'm giving them an opportunity to repent. I'm showing love and long-suffering to them. 
Uh, so verse three here, let's move on. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. So there's, there, if the other God's pleading with the main God, saying, get rid of the wicked. They're persecuting the poor. They're making it hard for everybody else. Let's just get rid of the problem and, and eliminate the wicked so that, that everybody else can have a better life and have things improve. So there's a lot of presuppositions. Again, God is a judge. God is over a council of gods, uh, judging everything and, and putting things in place. Uh, there are lesser gods. Uh, there's a lot of great assumptions that are made in here that's really so cool to think about this. And it's not that God allows wickedness to happen, but we have to understand that God, when we look at the greater understanding of the scriptures, God allows agency to happen. If we make a choice to do something against somebody else, he's going to let us do that. Because this life is about proving us, testing us. Abraham 3.25 this life is about no helping us know, are we going to be worthy of further improvements in the next life? That's celestial kingdom and exaltation. So it's up to us to make those choices. And God allows that because if he stopped that, then there's no punishments. I mean, it's kind of, it goes back to that idea, if you remember the movie Minority Report. If you stop somebody from committing a crime, then how can we punish them? if they never committed it. That was the whole premise of that story. They had a bunch of clairvoyants, those three clairvoyant people who would see a crime before it happened, and then the police would show up and arrest you just before you committed the crime. But yet it caused that philosophy, the idea of, well, if I didn't commit the crime, if you stopped me from committing it, then have I actually committed a crime? And if I haven't, then you can't hold me. There's no law basically. So by allowing, if God stopped people from uh, exercising their agency in wrong ways, there would be no justice, no punishment, because God would destroy justice. So allowing people their agency is an important point for judgments and for that the end of life stuff that we've got to go through, those judgments we've learned about, some of those other Psalms we've read. So verse 5, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. So again, the wicked don't realize how bad it is. They don't understand how miserable they're making it for everybody else, the problems that they're causing. The earth is out of whack. It's out of sync. There's problems going on. Patterns are out of whack. It's just a bad situation overall, God. And why are you not going to do something about this? Uh, this could have been maybe something. I mean, this could be around, you know, obviously... Israel, the exile, those kind of challenges and things that are happening. Uh, we could look at this again as probably reminiscent of the Enoch story as well, with the flood coming with justice and things as well. Now, verse 6 is one that has caused a lot of consternation for modern Christianity. And this is the actual one that Jesus used against the scribes and Pharisees as well. In verse 6, it says, I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are the are children of the Most High. <clears throat> so in here, this scripture says that God has told us that we are gods. And we are children of the Most High. We are the children of Elion, the High God. Which means we have God-like opportunity, God-like inheritance, because we are his children. Which again, if we are his children, he is our Father, there's got to be a mother in there as well. So there's some other assumptions we can put in there also, which is great. Um, but this is the scripture that the Savior quoted to the Pharisees and the scribes going, but it doesn't say in the scriptures that ye are gods. So why are you getting complaining that I told you that I am the son of God? Because the scriptures tell us we are all sons of God. So the Savior kind of takes it and says, well, generally we are all sons of God, technically. So I, I didn't speak out of turn at all. But in reality, I actually really am the real son of God, the, the son of God, not just a son of God, the son of God. Um, but that was, it was a great thing he used, and he used this Psalms 82 to do this. And you'll see this quoted in other places as well. The Psalms 82 is a, a rather important one to learn more about. Now, verse 7, But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit 
all nations. So again, you're frail, you're human, you are godlike potential, but you'll eventually still die. You have to go through that. That's just part of life, basically, of this whole process. Think long-term, not short-term strategy, once again. And that this is great that we have a council in heaven that is guiding and helping go through the things that we're dealing with and helping put the works of God forward, which is really cool. Some really cool ideas we get from section, or from that section, from Psalms 80. So I'd love to hear in the comments your thoughts and ideas on this psalm as well. What does this mean to you? How does this help you in understanding your relationship with God as you go through and look at this psalm? So I look forward to having that conversation with you in the comments. Let's jump over to the next psalm as we continue to learn.